Hey, grab your Bible. Grab your Bible. It's important to have your Bible today, whether it's, uh, whether it's the one in your hand or in your phone or uh, your, your Bible Bible, or if you need the one, there's one right down by your feet. And um, turn to page uh, 443 in that Bible. It's Jeremiah chapter 29. And um, to, get, to get to get there in a minute, we're going to read a bunch of other things today. Uh, I'm excited about a, a word that uh, uh, I'm going to share with you today, kicking off some vision I believe that God has for us for 2024. Last year, we uh, started this year with this word dominion. In 2023, the word dominion was the word that uh, God had spoke to us about, and it spoke of the ultimate authority in our lives, that, that all authority lies with God, but as children of God, we get to walk under his authority, under his authority, and in his authority. And uh, we talked about positioning ourselves with a heart of quorum Deo, which meant to live before the face of God, under his authority, in the face of God, in his presence, under his authority. I have a question for you. How many of you in 2023 uh, faced some difficulties that challenged you in your ability to live under the authority of God? Maybe you have some of those difficulties that might have happened that made like, it was difficult, like God, you are my authority, but I wanna take control back because things are not going the way maybe I thought that they should go. It might have been financial issues or health issues or relationship issues or marriage issues. Listen, when life happens, it challenges who is really sitting on the throne of our hearts. When life happens, when difficult things, it will challenge who is really sitting on the throne of your heart. When things don't go the direction you intend, it will challenge your faith. But listen, you're, you're here today. Some of you were shaken, but you're here today. Some of you were disappointed, but somehow God has carried you into 2024. And as I was praying about the word for 2024 for grace and the direction that I felt like the Lord had for us, he gave me this word, and the word is lead. Lead, to simply Lead. He, he's calling us to step up our leadership and our ability to lead. And in order to lead, the first thing that happens is we first lead myself. God calls us to lead ourselves first and, and to lead myself and then to lead others and to, uh, for some possibly to lead leaders. Not just in our church, but in our homes and in our profession and in our relationships. And I want to encourage you, if you will embrace the word of God this year, like many of you did last year, you're going to see God position you in places you never thought you would be, places beyond comprehension. God is going to position you and reposition you throughout this year as you grab a hold of this word lead. And so today, I want to share a couple foundational things uh, that we're going to build upon in the weeks to come. So listen, buckle up, buckle up. The next couple of weeks, we're going to dig into what we believe God is saying to us in regard to this word lead and today I want to start by reminding us of the call, the gift, the anointing that's on our church, on us as believers, and how we can partner with it. I, uh, I, I sent a letter out to all of you who are partners and members here at Grace about, um, about a journal that I had for you, a gift that I had for you. And um, if you have not picked that up yet, they have them at the office window and I want to encourage everybody to do something different this year. I talked about lead last, last week a little bit and leadership and whatever we're called to lead that really involves change, that there's some change that's involved in our life. And if you're not somebody that's a journaler, like I've never been a journaler before. I write tons of notes. I usually have little scraps of paper all over the place. I write all the time, but nothing that's organized. And last year, I got a journal at the beginning of the year that somebody gave me, and I thought, okay, I'm going to start writing stuff down. And I could not believe how many times the Lord took me back through what I'd written down. Many times I try to find what I've written down, and I can't because it's on some loose piece of paper laying around somewhere, crumpled up in a drawer. But because I had this journal, I was able to go back and do that. Some of you, that journal might be a digital journal. Some of you, it might be something like this one right here. Uh, it might be the one that we're going to give some of you. Um, but I'd encourage you to... Take time this year, especially with services you attend, places that, that you go where you could gain leadership, to not just come to church, absorb a few things and go home, never write anything down, and then in the middle of the week think, oh yeah, the pastor said something about that, but I can't remember what it was. How many times I thought I will never, ever forget that. It was so powerful on my heart. And one slice of pizza later, it was gone. The journal last year really helped me regurgitate 
and continue to digest the word that God was putting over my life. I've already started a journal for this year. I already have some things written down in here. And I would encourage you, if it's not today, I would encourage you to start journaling, to take some notes, that every place you go, you would take a note. Just what's God saying to me today? What might he be saying? You may be somebody that wants to write down all the points for a message, that's great, but really what I want you to do is to write down something that the Lord is speaking to you about that's a little bit of an aha moment. It might be a verse, it might be a word, it might be something that you can go back later and look at. So, you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? There we go. All right, Jeremiah chapter 29. We've, we've kind of been uh, using this verse as a, as a foundational set of verses for, for a while now. And this is a letter that was written to the, Babylon, the, to the Israelites who were in Babylon in captivity. They thought they were going to be there for just a short time. But the Lord said, no, you're going to be there for 70 years. And so here is a word that comes to Jeremiah, starting in verse 1. It says, this is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining exiled elders, the priests, the prophets, and all the people Nebuchadnezzar had deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had come and taken all these Israelites from Jerusalem and took them to Babylon. This was after King King, uh, Jeconiah the queen mother, the court officials, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, the metalsmiths had left Jerusalem. He sent the letter with Elasas, son of Shapon, and Jemariah, son of Hilkiah, lots of names I can pronounce very well, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And here's what the letter said to those that were in captivity. This is what the Lord of the armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Say that word, multiply. Multiply Multiply there. Do not decrease. Pursue. Say pursue. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for when it thrives, you will thrive. For this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Don't let your prophets who are among you and your diviners deceive you. There's some that are going to say they're from me and they're going to deceive you. Don't let them. And don't listen to the dreams you elicit from them, for they are prophesying falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. This is the Lord's declaration. For this is what the Lord says, when 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for your disaster, to give you a future and a hope. You will call to me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you you. I'll be found by you. Here in this letter to the Israelites in captivity, God says this. He says, invest in the city. Invest in the city. He says, build there. He says, increase, multiply. And then he says, pray to the Lord for on its behalf, when it thrives, you will what? Thrive. You'll thrive. In in a place of captivity, God says, you will thrive If you'll listen to me. Listen, here's a great statement. If you can't change it, if you can't change it and God has allowed it, then find out how to prosper in it. If you can't change it and God's allowed it in your life, then find out how to prosper in it. There's three things that happen when you're in, three ways you can respond when you are immersed in the culture. And we're immersed in culture here. You can either reject it and run and hide from it and isolate yourself and be no help to anybody. You can receive the culture and let it negatively affect you and rob you from God's blessing in your life. So you can reject it and run to the hills and hide from everybody and not be any good to anybody. You can receive it and let it negatively affect you and rob you from the influence you're supposed to have. Or you can redeem it by planting yourself in that culture but not receiving it, but rather leading in that place. This letter to Jeremiah is in this Babylonian captivity under King Nebuchadnezzar. We read about King Nebuchadnezzar in another book, the book of Daniel. Flip to Daniel chapter 1, 
And I want to read some things out of there today about leading in the culture. That's on page 500 of that Bible down by your feet. Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to read these first seven verses. It says, In the third year of the reign of King Joachim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. It's speaking about what we just read about in Jeremiah. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. Lowercase g, lowercase g. Verse 3, the king ordered Aspenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from no, the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledge, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. Go to those, go to those Hebrews and bring me some young men that have nobility in their bloodlines, who are, who are good-looking, who don't have defects, who are suitable for wisdom. Bring them to me. And it says, he was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time they were to attend the king. Among them from the Judites were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief eunuch gave them names. He gave them the name Belteshar to Daniel, Shadrach to to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Here King Nebuchadnezzar, he he took these four men who had been taken captive. He brought them into their palace and he began wooing them with money and delicacies. Listen, if you want to change the culture, then do it with the kids. If you want to change the culture, do it with the kids. It's, It's what's happening today over and over. It's happening right now on our watch. The culture is trying to be changed through the kids. The enemy, not flesh and blood, but powers and principalities in the heavenlies, is always attacking our culture as believers. And most often, it's doing it as our youth. It's why for the last several decades, they've said that the percentage of those that find Christ and find salvation past the age of 18 is really small. Because the enemy has been defining young people by the culture. The battle is for the children and the youth. It's why we've always had an emphasis on children and youth here at Grace. It's why we, it's why we, have, it's why we have age-appropriate ministry teaching them the scope and sequence of the Bible right now downstairs. It's why on Wednesday nights we, we bring children of all ages together and we begin to disciple them with real-life cultural issues that they're battling in. We believe it's important that they're discipled, that, that, that the priority of coming to church and learning and growing on Sunday and Wednesday is more important than all the other things we're committed to in the world. But the only people that can lead that is their parents. Is their parents. How does the enemy do it? How does he come and try to affect our lives as believers? How does he try to affect the lives of young men and women? He does it through money, through language, and through literature. Money and language and literature. These young Babylonian boys, if if the king could get their hearts, they were good-looking men, they were strong men, they were of nobility. If I can get their hearts, then I can get the hearts of all of the rest of the Hebrews that I've taken into captivity. If I can take away their God and place my idols on their hearts, then the, the whole thing will come crumbling down. That's what he was sowing into these young men. Let's entice them with money. They can have all the goods that the king has and full access to it, all the portions of the provisions that I have. He changed their language. Stop speaking Hebrew. Learn the language of the Chaldeans. Read our books, not of your God, but of our gods and idols. Let's infiltrate your life with money, language, and literature so that you will be reprogrammed from a God follower to an idol worshiper. That's still what's happening today. It's happening today. And all of this was aimed at changing their identity at changing their identity, the money, the language, the literature, all designed to change their identity. Here's what the culture wants to do. The culture wants to define your identity. The culture wants to tell you who you are. It wants to tell you how you should think. It wants to tell you what you should be carrying in your life. They want to, it wants to change your identity. 
And the king did it. He brought it down, and they decided with these, these three men, Dan, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, let's do it by changing their names. Let's change their names. The name Daniel, which means Yahweh, God is my judge, Yahweh, the king of kings, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh is my judge. Let's change that to Belteshazzar, which means Bel, protect the king. Bel was another um, god that they worshipped. And in this particular instance, it's used in a feminine vernacular. It could actually say that Daniel was changed to lady, protect the king. Hey, you are no longer a follower of God, but you are now a follower of, we're going to label you with a false idol, and I'm going to call you a girl. And I'm going to infiltrate your identity. Hananiah means Yahweh has been gracious to me. God has been gracious. Let's change that to Shadrach, which means fearful of the command of Abu. Abu was the moon god that they worshipped. You no longer are worshipping God, Yahweh. Now we're going to say you are the one that's under the command of the moon god. In other words, we're going to put demonic influence over your life. How about Mishael, which, or Hananiah, which all, Shadrach also means servant of sin. Servant of sin. No longer follower of God, but servant of sin. The next one, Mishael, means who is what Yahweh is. Meshach means who is a coup. Another idol worshiping God that they had. And it goes on and says, the next one is uh, um, Azariah, which says, Yahweh has helped me. Instead of that, Abed, Abednego is servant of Abu, the moon god. Servant of Abu. These men were told they were no longer under the image of God, but under the image of a new God and they, that, who had a new identity for them and new standards for them to live by. We're not called to receive the culture but redeem it by setting the culture in our lives. Why do we as the church, now listen, this messed with me. When I began, when, 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 when I heard somebody share this a while ago about the names and what they meant. How do we know, we know Daniel is Daniel, but how do we know these, how, what do, how do we recite the names of these three Hebrew men? What, what are the words that we as believers use over them? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why did we as the church, I mean it's gone on for decades, generations, why do we call them by their false identity? Why do we agree with the false identity over their life? Instead of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Why do, why do we agree with the false identity? And you know what, we still do it today, not with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but we also agree with the false identity that the culture is trying to speak over the lives of our young men and women. We think it's compassion, but it's not at all. We're not called to speak false truths over somebody. We're called to speak truth over them. And once identities are changed, then come the standards. Daniel chapter one, verse eight. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. Yet he said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has signed your food and drink. What if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us, let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. He agreed with them for this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine and to drink and to give them vegetables. Listen, Daniel won the battle here, but what were they trying to do? They were trying to define their identity and also to determine their standards. The culture wants to define your identity. It wants to tell you who you are, and it wants to determine your standards. It wants to tell you how you should live. There's only one thing that should tell you how to live. It's this book right here. As a believer, this is the book that should tell you how to live. The culture, now listen, Daniel, he was in the place where, man, he could have died, right? 
Like, just cave, just cave to the standards. It's all right, just let it in. It's a, what's, what's it matter if you eat the king's food? They were trying to get him to eat this food that was offered to, to, and sacrificed to idols. That's, that's what they were not supposed to do. If they could get them to compromise, then they would have them. Yahweh would no longer have a grip on their hearts, but instead the culture would define them. Listen, the culture is trying to invade your home through media, entertainment, social media. It is constantly trying to set your standard and get you to compromise. The culture will try to try and lure you in through humor. It'll use humor. It wants to lower your standard through sexual humor and false compassion strategies, trying to get you to renounce and redefine the word of God in your life. It's subtle and it's strategic, all designed to lower your standards, call you old-fashioned. Leaders, like Daniel and the boys, they set the culture. Leaders set the culture. In chapter two, we see King Nebuchadnezzar become troubled and sleepless due to a, a dream that he had had, and he called forth all of his magicians and mediums and sorcerers and asked them, hey, tell me my dream and the interpretation. Tell me the dream and the interpretation. Of course that was ridiculous. How, how could they have an interpretation if they didn't know the dream? Nevertheless, the king was agitated, ordered them all to death, which would have included Daniel and those guys. And the news came to Daniel, and Daniel asked for some time to consult with God, uh, Yahweh, not Abu or Aku or Bel, but Yahweh. Daniel says, give me a few days and I'll have the answer. Chapter two, verse 17 then Daniel went to his house and told his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah about the matter, urging them to ask the God of heavens for mercy concerning this mystery. So Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of Babylon's wise men. The mystery was then revealed to Daniel in a vision at night, and Daniel praised the God of the heavens. And then he declared, may the name of God be praised forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. He changes the times and seasons, removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells within him. I offer thanks and praise to you, God of my fathers, because you have given me wisdom and power. And now you have let me know what we have asked of you, for you have let us know the king's mystery. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had assigned to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He came and said to him, don't destroy the wise men of Babylon. He not only saved himself, but he also saved these other guys. Bring me before the king and I will give them their interpretation. And so Daniel, he comes and he gives this interp interpretation to King Nebuchadnezzar. He, he tells him his dream and gives him the interpretation. And in verse 47, the king said to Daniel, your God is indeed God of God's Lord of kings and revealers of mysteries since you were able to reveal the mystery. Listen, we are designed to bring something to the world in which we live. And when we bring it, God, Yahweh, will be exalted. We are designed to bring something into the culture that will exalt God. But listen, the culture wants to define your identity. It wants to determine your standards, and it wants to dictate your worship. Think about it today. It wants to tell you who you are, it wants to tell you what to do, and it wants to tell you how to worship. It wants to dictate your worship. The culture, all of the culture, it wants to tell you those things. King Nebuchadnezzar, he takes this dream that Daniel interpreted, and then he winds up building himself this huge statue and dictates that everyone fall to their knees and worships it. And this is our culture today wanting to dictate your worship, telling you to worship self, to worship nature, to worship celebrity, to worship sex, to worship idols. That's the culture today, right? And unfortunately, many believers fall victim. They don't know what they believe about themselves and their identity. They don't know what they believe about the standards God has in their lives, and they don't know how to worship God and God alone. And these Hebrew children, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they were not going to bow and worship anyone other than Yahweh. And it didn't matter they'd been given false names trying to convince them to worship someone else. It didn't matter that they had been dictated to live with unholy standards. They were simply not going to bow. And in Daniel chapter three, starting in verse 13, it says this, then in a furious rage, Nebuchadnezzar gave orders to bring, of course he calls them, what did Nebuchadnezzar call them? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
So these men were brought before the king Nebuchadnezzar and asked them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, is it true that you don't deserve my gods or worship the gold statue I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drums, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the statue I made, but if you don't worship it, you will, I, I, will, you, I will immediately, you will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire, and who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of the king. That's faith, right? If God exists, he can rescue us. But this next statement's even more powerful. Even more powerful because this is what shipwrecks so many believers. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. He can, but even if he doesn't, I'm not changing my worship. When God doesn't show up in the way that you want him to, does it change your worship? When you believe and you believe and he doesn't move and you still are going through some sort of something that you are not planning in your life, does it change your worship? These men said, listen, God can. He can heal me. He can save me. He can free me. He can. But even if he doesn't, I am not going to worship the culture. Not going to do it. Nebuchadnezzar throws him in the furnace, cranked up the heat, should have died instantly. Verse 24, then Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. He said to his advisors, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. He exclaimed, look, I see four men not tied, walking around in the, in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because that's how he named them. Your servants of the most high God, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. When the satraps, pre prefects, governors, and the king's advisors gathered around, they saw that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Not a hair on their heads was singed. Their robes were unaffected, and there was no smell of fire on them. And Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Praise to the God, praise to Yahweh of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He sent his angel and rescued his servants who trusted in him. They violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, if I, therefore I issue a decree that anyone of any people, nation, or language who says anything offensive against Yahweh, they will be torn limb from limb and his house made a garbage dump. For there is no other god who is able to deliver like this. There's no other god. These men were leaders in Babylon the place of captivity. They, they refused to let the culture set their identity, standards, and worship. They knew who, their, who they were, and they knew who their God was. I have a couple of questions for you. And I want you to get one more thing this morning. Does the private life of a leader truly impact his or her public life? Does your private life affect your public life? Does your private life affect the ability for God to move in your public life? Daniel, Daniel and these boys, they had what it took. Daniel had character. He had character. This is our leadership lesson today, character. He could have tried to merely survive his experience as a captive in a foreign land. Instead, he never left his disciplined life of character and personal commitment to God. Daniel was tested. He was tested in his diet. He wouldn't compromise on ritually unclean foods and only ate vegetables. He was tested in his motives. He didn't take credit for interpreting dreams, but glorified God instead. In his honesty, he spoke truth to authorities regardless of the unpopularity. In his disciplines, he continued to pray daily even though it might cost him his life. In his integrity, he had no interest in bribes or a payoff. In his convictions, he stayed committed to his friends and beliefs even as he rose through the ranks. Listen, how a leader deals with circumstances of life tells you many things about character. How a leader 
deals with circumstances of life will tell you things about character. Crisis doesn't necessarily make character, but it certainly reveals it. Crisis doesn't make character. We all go through crisis, but it will reveal character. Adversity makes a person choose one or one of two paths, character or compromise. When adversity comes, will I be a man or a woman of character or a person of compromise? Every time a leader chooses character, they grow stronger. Every time. Character is the foundation a leader builds their life on because leadership operates on the basis of trust. People will follow a leader only as long as they can trust them because character, character creates, communicates credibility. Character harnesses respect. Character creates consistently consistency. Character earns trust. Character is more than talk. Anyone can say they have integrity, but action is the real indicator of character. You can never separate a leader's character from their actions. That's what Daniel did, right? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, and never do it. No character. Character is more than talent. We don't get to choose our abilities, but we get to choose our character. We create it each time we make choices. There's plenty of actors and musicians and athletes who have talent but no character, and they're not leaders. We put them on pedestals as if they are. Some some athletes have always said, I'm not your role model. You want to know why? Because they knew they had a deficiency of character. Character is more than me. True leadership always involves others and brings lasting success with people. Followers do not trust leaders whose character they know to be flawed, and they will not continue to follow them. Many times, many times some of us, you know, we want to be leaders, but we have no followers. One reason is because we have a desire to lead, and it's all about me and not them. It's a weakness in my identity that it's about me to be a leader. It's not about impacting somebody else's life. When the focus is on me and my achievements, then I will fail to develop followers, and I won't be a leader. I don't need followers. Jesus is the one whom we are to follow. But true leadership will create followers of Jesus. True leadership. Character is more than service. Character will either limit or support a leader depending on its strength. Leaders cannot rise above the limitations of their character. It will always determine whether a leader finishes well. And if I'm not honest about my limitations and ask God to help me work through them, It will be hard for me to be someone who develops trust. If I can work on them little by little and refine myself, it will be a testimony of God to others. So why should I develop leadership in 2024? Why should I develop leadership? I want to read to you out of Isaiah 58, the Message Bible. It's a paraphrase with some modern language. And um, Catherine Ranola read this over us in October, and um, when I get to the end, there's a statement that she read out of there, and I can't tell you, like, I know when, when God says, boom, <laughs> when the Lord speaks to me, and why should we lead? It comes down to this phrase I'm going to share at the end. Isaiah 58, I'm going to read most of this chapter. Shout, a full-throated shout. You all know I like a full-throated shout. Like, Jesus, hold nothing back, a trumpet blast shout. Tell my people what's wrong with their lives. Face my family, Jacob, with their sins. They're busy, busy, busy at worship and love studying all about me. To all appearances, they're a nation of right-living people, law-abiding, God-honoring, and they ask me, what's the right thing to do? And love having me on their side, but they also complain, why do we fast and you don't look our way? Why do we humble ourselves you don't even notice? Well, here's why. The bottom line on your fast days is profit. You drive your employees too much too hard. You fast, but at the same time, you bicker and fight. You fast, but you swing a mean fist. The kind of fasting you won't get, your this kind of fasting won't get your prayers off the ground. Do you think this is the kind of fast day I'm after? A day to show off humility, to put put on a pious long face and parade along solemnly in black? Do you call that fasting? A fast day that I, God, would like. In other words, is it just about appearances? Is it just about me? Is is it just about you? Are you going to honor me with your life? Why are you even fasting? He says, this is the kind of fast day I'm after. To break the chains of injustice. To get rid of exploitation in the workplace. Free the oppressed. 
canceled debts. What I'm interested in seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad, being available to your own families. That's a great fast, being available to your own families, men and women. Men not stop being so busy with work. Women stop being so busy with social media. Guys, take that about yourself as well. Too busy with work. Do this and the lights will turn on. And your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. Character. The God of glory will secure your passage. Then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out for help and I'll say, here I am. If you get rid of unfair practices, quit blaming victims. Quit gossiping about other people's sins. One of the biggest issues of the church. Spreading like wildfire today. Gossip, gossip, gossip about other people's sins. If you are generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. Our culture is a dark place. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight. I will always show you where to go. Listen to this last paragraph. I'll give you a full life in the emptiest of places. Firm muscles, strong bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew, rebuild the foundations from out of your past. All these things that we read about in verses 6 through six through 11, things we're going to talk about this year. Because what do you want to be known as? You'll be known as those who can fix anything. Restore old ruins. Rebuild and renovate Make the community livable again. You'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate, make the community livable again. Why do we need to develop our leadership to make the community livable? To make our community that we live in, the place we've been called and pulled into captivity, what we read in Jeremiah 29, not to reject and run and hide, not to receive the culture and become like them, but redeem the culture by being established and leading, just as these verses shared with us, so that we can make the community livable, leading like Daniel. Don't let the culture change your identity and your standards and your worship. Instead, be the change. It's the mandate upon our church here at Grace to make the community livable. From the beginning of days when this place was a Bible study and it came together and wrote these incredible articles of incorporation of how the love of God was gonna impact our community, that is what we are called to do at Grace. Different churches are called to do different things. We are called to make the community livable. They started off years ago by starting a Christian school that ran in the basement here, that now is Faith Christian School. They started off years ago by having a satellite Bible school to instruct people in the Word of God in all kinds of other ways to a vision to reach the community with the love of Christ. And years later, we, we found ways to simply love, taking something of cruise night that had become a, a, a really heel in the community because it became a drunken party and trashed our community that one night we decided, you know what, tomorrow we're not gonna complain about the drunkenness and the carousing. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go pick up trash. And I'll never forget the guy who was standing on 25th Street where there was hundreds of people partying the night before and he wasn't just picking up trash but he picked up every cap off of a beer bottle in that yard. Never said a word to those people that were making debauchery out of our city and trash was everywhere. Do you know what doesn't happen on cruise night anymore? Trashing of our city. You wanna know why? Because we said we're gonna make the community livable. We're gonna take cruise night, which is a great thing, and we're gonna invest in a way. We're not gonna criticize and complain. We're just gonna go do something. And for several years, we got up in the morning, we picked up trash up and down the streets until finally the city said, you know what? We should put more trash cans out. And now they do, and you know what? There's way less trash in the streets. That's deciding to say, you know what? Let's make the community livable. Let's do something. We got up on, some of you got up with me. Not all of you, some of you did. You got up with me on Sunday morning and went and picked up trash before church. To restore. We started doing things 
started doing these events. And uh, my friend Josh Erickson came up with this idea of how to, what if we printed our own banners and, and we put them on these PVC pipes and we used those around town to catch people's attention and advertise some things that we're doing. Is there anything that's advertised in our town today that doesn't use PVC pipes and a banner? <laughs> that's where it started with Josh. We started doing this thing called the Big Eagle Extravaganza to just love our community, just to love people. People's lives have been impacted and changed as we did that for, for years, and then we changed it to the Big Eagle Freedom Fest, and we had a big fireworks show and all kinds of things, and thousands of people came. I'll never forget the lady that walked on the property and just started weeping because she'd been under so much oppression, she'd never experienced peace until she walked on our property. I'll never forget the lady who pulled up over here in her car, saw this big event going on with inflatables and tents and food, and this young boy got out of the car, and he ran over to one of our parking attendants, Chris Mays, and he said, hey, mister, how much does this cost? He said, it's all free. And that little boy ran back to his car. He said, mom, mom, it's all free. And this mom got out of a car with five kids and walked over and said, I have nothing. I could not celebrate today. Thank you for doing this for my family. Seeds of love that are planted, defying the culture. How many times has somebody asked us, why do you do this for free? Why aren't you charging something? Because that's not part of the culture. The culture says charge, pay. But instead we said, let's give. Because that's how communities are changed. As you love and you serve and you give. For years, we've done an Easter egg hunt and a trunk or treat, just bringing some life and joy and giving away Bibles and praying and just believing people's lives be impacted as they came. The Lord started talking to me about this last year. We're not going to do an Easter egg hunt this year. There's, when we first started doing it, there was very few in town. Now there's like 25 you can choose from. We're going to find some, a different way to reach our community in a new way very well might not do trunk or treat this year. Same thing. There'll be new opportunities in 2024. It's not about grace, but about Carney in the region. What is God leading us to do? Develop our leadership so that we can impact. Impact businesses by practices, by business practices by exemplifying God and not the culture, his standards. Impact education by teaching and training our kids and it starts at home. Impact the media by developing stories of success that honor God. Impact family by developing character and integrity in relationships. Impact entertainment by voting with our dollars. We did a lot of that this year. We voted with our dollars on the movie Sound of Freedom, and we, 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 um, we, we paid for 6,000 of the 8,000 people that sat in the theaters to watch Sound of Freedom Hopefully seeing that there's a real cause of human trafficking that needs to be addressed right here, in amidst, uh, right here among us. Impact government by participating and engaging with godly, sol- with godly solutions to problems. I'm going to leave you with this in John 1 verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory and the glory as the one and only son from the father. Full of grace and truth. Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. Listen, grace and love open the the door for divine encounters. Grace and love open the door for divine encounters. Truth sets you free. Truth without grace is just mean. Grace without truth Meaningless. Grace and truth, it's meaningful. Make a decision today to be part of the process. Make a decision today to grow in leadership in 2024. Make a decision today. Say, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to come on Wednesday nights for the next eight weeks to our lead nights. I can't encourage you enough with this. Listen, if you want to develop your character, if you want to allow change to take place in your life, if you're tired of the way things are, if you believe that maybe God is speaking to us about leadership, come on Wednesday nights. 
Come on Wednesday nights for the next eight weeks. We're going to have a little bit of worship. Pastor Chris is going to share with us out of the book of Titus. We're going to encourage one another. And I believe at the end of those eight weeks, you're going to walk out and say, you know what, I'm stronger today. Some of you will say, well, I'll come to the first one or I'll come to the second one, but you won't prioritize it and say, I'm going to be at all eight weeks. Those who say, I'm going to be at all eight weeks, you're going to see the Lord meet you in a place that you've never been. Those who say, I'm going to be as, at as many of them as I can. This place should be as full on Wednesday nights as it is today. Because you believe that we're called to make our community livable, and in order to do that, we're called to be leaders, and we all need to grow in our leadership, every one of us. i got so much to share about that. In the next four weeks on Sunday mornings, I'm going to share about that. Why don't you stand with me? I want you to ask the Holy Spirit a question. Who is the one that God wants you to impact this year? We talk in our growth track that leadership is influence. Who do you have influence with that God wants you to impact this year? Leadership might be affecting one person's life by investing in them. Holy Spirit, we just want to take a moment right now. Why don't you just bow your head and close your eyes just to put your attention on the Lord. Holy Spirit, who is the one? Will you speak to us about the one today and throughout this week? Who is the one that you have a burden for that you want to put a burden on my heart? That throughout this year I can sow into. That I can love well. Holy Spirit, who is the one? Will you, will you show me today and throughout this week? Will you begin to show me throughout this month? Who is the one that you want me to invest in this year? Who's the one for 2024? Why develop your leadership? The lives of those that you love and the lives of those you live around are at stake. They need you to develop your leadership and make the community livable. King Nebuchadnezzar, all these horrible things happened to him. He lost it all. He roamed the earth. He was eating grass. He was a chocolate mess. And then freedom came. All because four guys developed their character and their leadership. Verse 34, but at the end of those, chapter 4, 34, at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven and my sanity returned to me. Then I praised the Most High and honored and glorified him who lives forever. Here's the verse we read last year many times. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, and he does what he wants with the army of heaven. And the inhabitants of the earth, there is no one who can block his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that time, my sanity returned to me and my majesty and splendor returned to me for, glory of, for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and my nobles, they sought me out. I was reestablished over my kingdom. Some of you are going to be reestablished in leadership this year. You've been out of leadership for a long time. God's going to reestablish you in leadership, some in the church, some in the community, some in your homes. And even more greatness came to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, I praise and exalt and glorify the king of the heavens because all his works are true and his ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. Heavenly Father, we come to you today on this first day, the first Sunday of 2024. Father, I, I want to acknowledge and receive the word that you've given me as we lead this year in 2024. Father, would you help us to live lives of character? Would you help us, Lord, not to let culture develop our identity? Would you help us not to let the culture determine our standards? Would you help us, Lord, not to let the culture dictate our worship? But instead, would we be known as men and women who, who know who we are, who know who you are, who live according to your word and worship you and you alone? Father, for some of us, there's some things that we need to eliminate in our lives. We need to take a real fast from. We need to eliminate them. 
There's some things that have handicapped us. It's kept us from being engaged with our family. It's, it's kept us from uh, growing in your word. It's kept us from being salt and light in this earth. There's some things we need to eliminate. Throughout this month, I ask you, Holy Spirit, will you show us those things that we need to eliminate? Father, there's some new things that we need to embrace in this next month. Lord, will you begin to reveal to us those things that we need to embrace so that we can be the leaders you've called us to be? Father, we want to impact our city. We want to make the community livable. We just want to do our part. We don't, we don't want people to, we, we don't want to be acknowledged. We want to acknowledge you. We don't want to do it to get some sort of credibility. We want to do it to honor you, God. How can we make our community livable? We ask you, Holy Spirit, will you show us? Will you give us new ideas, new ways of outreach? Will you give us things that we can do to invest and, and engage with our community? Would you help us to listen well and to love well? Would you help us to engage and encourage those that, that we come in contact with? Would you help us to advance them and activate them? Would you help us to declare over them your truth and discern your will over their lives that you would be exalted? Father, help us in 2024. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, give God praise for his word today. Come on, be men and women of truth and grace so that what you say can be meaningful. Amen. Be blessed. Have a great week. If you need prayer today, the people down front to pray with you, we'd love to encourage you. Be blessed. Have a great day. Encourage someone as you leave. I can't wait to share next week the next piece God's laid on my heart. See you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, right here. Full children's ministry available. <laughs>